roll when they are rolling, so okay. you may go at any point. Okay. okay, give me give me a give me a finger, <laughs> Dan, we'll start down? the show. Yeah, give me a countdown, please. Okay, you want toes or fingers? Dan, just give One, me two, something. three, there it is. <laughs> See, I was good timing on mine. One, two, three, and she lets it go. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sweet child. As Julie recovers, <laughs> I'd like to introduce you to the next UKD and Jinx show. Thanks for joining us. Julie, yes. why don't you make some announcements here? We have announcements before we get going. All right. Well, first, I'd like to thank our our uh, wonderful sponsor here, the Palace Theater and Art Bar, for mm -hmm. having us once again. Yes. Every first Tuesday, we record down here yep. at 8 p.m. So definitely come on down. Uh, I think we're going to have another show. I don't know what day the first Tuesday is in October. Yeah, but we'll have a show then. Though. But we will have a show then. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, before I go ahead and introduce our wonderful fabulous guest guest here uh, we do have a brand new sponsor that we want to talk about yes we do our sponsor is mark aronowitz that's right mark aronowitz and he has an amazing service uh, he has an outfit called mark's si mark's artist signature service and other elves and goblins so if you're a big magic artist and you have a bunch of cards you need them signed you send them to mark he takes care of it He's in touch with 75 magic artists. You need uh, uh, altars done, little magic paintings done, other kind of art by these artists. You send it to Mark, he handles everything. He's got a wonderful thing going. And we want to thank Mark for, uh, yeah, for, for joining, being, us. Yes, for joining yeah. us. So thanks, uh, Mark. We will have more information about Mark and his, uh, his service on our YouTube. What is it, this, the little description there? Yeah, mm -hmm. it'll be in our description. And running on the credits at the end of the show. Yes, and also, good. Mark will also have a list of up and coming shows that he will be at with some of his magic art, with some of his magic, with his magic artist pals. So you want to check that out if you're a big fan and stop and say hi, he take it and he'll handle you. Yeah. Yeah. Or he'll handle what you need, <laughs> <laughs> not handle you. <laughs> that's my job. No, that's, that's fine. Both kind of sound the same, but anyway. <laughs> exactly. Depends so on how Julie, you look at it. Yeah. Why don't you talk about our wonderful guest that we have today? Yeah, tonight we have our uh, astounding, astounding guest, rock and fashion photographer, Paul Hernandez. Greetings. Yeah. So, so Paul is a native Seattleite. He's born and bred here in Seattle. Uh, he started his photography career in the, I believe it was the early 80s, correct? Mid eighties, probably. Mid eighties, yeah. yeah. Mid mid ish eighties. Yeah. Mid mid ish eighties. Eighty six, eighty seven, something. Like that. So and and although he has spanned a wide variety of topics with his photography, I mean, he's done fashion, he's done still lives, he's done um, a lot art of, photography, a lot of rock and roll stuff. But he did a lot of rock yeah. and roll stuff, particularly the the stuff that was getting big in the eighties, um, from uh, what eighty six on. Mm -hmm. uh, you were really busy from about 87 to 93 here in Seattle before yeah. you headed off. You jet set it out of, of uh, off Seattle. To Europe and off to Europe other places and other adventures. Did super but, yeah. fashion stuff. Um, you also worked... Um, growth. Yeah. I'm all about growth. So, so to me, art is growth. Growth is art. It, it, they combine each other. So to become more, you must assimilate yourself in many different situations and in, in, in many different forms, which means a lot of different places and lifestyles and understanding different people and who they are and their hearts and their souls and capturing people in, in those moments, you have to be with them, I think. Oh, yeah. Be a part of that so. environment. And when I go travel and go places, uh, when I lived in Italy, the running on the back streets and just being with, with the local people was the most important thing to me because of the flavor of the city, and I wanted the flavor, so when I did go out and do my art and do my work, that flavor was instilled within me. So that flavor was out there and it'd be in the work. Same thing happened with rock and roll. Same sensibility. Now you're Hanging with the boys and getting, getting, getting who they are as people and their wants and their desires and, and what they're reaching for and understanding that, implementing that in, 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 the, in the work itself. Boys and girls. Yeah. 
because there are girls in rock too. <laughs> oh yeah, so, but I'm saying the boys that I shot. Yes. Um, but yes, there are girls in rock too. Of course there is. <laughs> There's tons of girls in rock. Right? Okay. <laughs> Understood, right, Julie. Yes. yes. So I know that um, you, I know music, particularly music and fashion, are your key, your two key loves in photography. Uh, they're a little bit different, um, the work that you've done in fashion versus uh, in rock. And I know that um, there's a bit of a distinction, although I, I know that a lot of actually photographers that do rock photography or music photography tend to also gravitate towards fashion as well. Um, what drove you, what, what drove you in those directions? Like, like what, what made you go from, you know, from, from where you started, where you first were, were, you know, what, photographing still lives and things like that to music, for example? Interesting story. Um, did you read my story that I wrote? Yes. Gave you? Okay, okay. So, um, <laughs> let's step back a, f a, f a few inches with that one. So, as a child, I wanted to be a guitar player more than anything in the world. That was what I wanted to do. I wanted to be a rock star, like anyone does. All young boys do. And I play guitar like crazy, nonstop. Mm -hmm. Well, I was working in a machine shop um, in the mid-70s or so. Um, back then, uh, working in shops was like working in a sweatshop, essentially. There wasn't very much, there wasn't L&I, there wasn't any OSHA or anything protecting machinery or you. So, um, I was going to high school, trying to graduate, and I was working in this machine shop. Late hours, staying up late, doing music all night, going to school, then working, and then it caught up to me, I think, a little bit, but um, the environment I was in was really bad, and the machine was like a, a it was a shear, and there was a pedal that you, on the floor that you kick, and sometimes the damn thing would just go off on its own. <laughs> and back then, they didn't wipe the metal off or anything. It came in oily, greasy, you had to push it through the shear, and a lot of times I would use gloves to do it, and so on and so forth, just to get some kind of grip, but then those would go bad pretty soon in a short amount of time. After a while, you're just to hell with it. I just want to get this stuff going, get it through the machine. <clears throat> and um, one time, I'm, my name was called, and my hands sort of slipped on the machine. My foot was completely away from the pedal, and the machine went off, and my fingers were in the machine, and I lost two of them completely chop chopped off. Um, I knew instantly that my career days were probably done. For guitar I mean, guitar, yeah. you know, yeah. were probably done. And, and, and so, and of course, right when I went to the doctor, that was expressed to me right away, very clearly. They were able to sew them back on, but for years, they did, didn't, there wasn't any movement in them or, or anything. I was just sort of stuck with, with bad fingers, and this is the finger, just a huge scar on it and stuff, and there's a bone that sort of sticks out. So, in other words, to be, a guitar player, there's no bar chords that I can do, or, or the scales or modes that I was pretty proficient at were gone instantly, because it's just, just not there. So I play a little bit more now, but the best I can, but it's usually two, two fingers, two or three fingers, so it's a lot of, a lot of my own kind of, I do my own tuning so I can get kind of a bigger sound mm -hmm. with just a couple fingers, because that's all I have to play with. There's still speed in these fingers, and clarity, and, and, and power, and, and beauty in them that all the fingers had, and desire, but there's only so much they can do. Sometimes I can somewhat use these, this one more than this one, this one not at all. Every once in a while I can, it'll, it'll do something for me, like it'll hold down something, a string, but it's, it's just for a quick moment, and then, it, and then it, there's, there's um, like a spiking pain that'll, that'll just go through my hand, through my finger, and it's and that's good. it. And yeah, didn't, so didn't Tony Iommi lose part of a finger in an yeah, industrial he did. accident when he was and a kid actually, too. He had, he had a cap. He put a yeah, cap he put a, on like it. a cap on his finger. And, and, but yeah. mine was chopped off yeah, on yeah, the side. Yeah. So mine has a bone and stuff. So they, for about three years, it was in the it was in the stint type thing. Both these were, but this one especially. Mm -hmm. So, um, I was devastated by this. It led to horrible drug abuse. A lot of bad things in my life. Um, Riding Harleys in a Kang, I mean, whatever I could to do 
to, to try to wash the shit out of me or get mm -hmm. rid of it or, or this loss or this devastation that you never really can get rid of. You don't ever get rid of that. You don't ever really settle it. You don't really ever have peace with it. What you have to do is learn how to live with it and find a different way of managing it and other ways of, of finding bliss in life and hope in, in that energy. Unfortunately, music is the only thing that really, for me, really contained that, that place with it in my heart. Mm -hmm. That was the one thing that drove me, that just, oh. Wake up in the middle of the night, I'd hear music in my head constantly, and I'd jump out of bed and like, in the middle of the night start, okay, there's this riff, there's this pattern, there's this chord here with this chord, and it was just, it was nonstop going through my head. Yeah. So all that was cut off. Also musicians must give, that's why the musicians are musicians, because they give, they give the gift of music, and they have to give. That's why they're musicians, that's what it's all about. It's getting up on stage and giving, giving this, this, this sound, this place within themselves, this, this, these words that sometimes are in our minds but we can't always say, but these guys are up on stage performing and saying it back to us. Like, okay, there's that relationship, there's that place, there's that understanding, there's that hope, there's that I'm not the only one, there's a bunch of things. Rock and roll is one of the few places that really has that mm. for me. Great. So, well, when did you pick up your first camera and went, hey, this is pretty cool? So, um, riding Harleys, I was in a club. Um, I had a motorcycle thing for years, which I still do, a Harley thing. I had an older stepbrother who was a rider, mm -hmm. so that was a big influence. Throughout most of my family were Harley people. So, um, one of the brothers in the club, I was in a club called the Long Riders, small family club, but. Mm -hmm known by the Gypsy Jokers, Hells Angels, so okay. on and so forth. But we were more of a small type family club, mm -hmm. but still badass as anybody else, so on and so forth, take care of ourselves. Um, packing 45, selling drugs was what I used to do. That's what I used to look like. Did you, you know? go up to the body shop by chance? The body you, shop. It's up in Bellingham. That's Bandito <laughs> Vilda. <though. laughs> Mm, I'm just no curious if you shot. went up no. there. Okay. No, we used to go on runs up around that area. Well, I was, just I was curious because my dad used to play, uh, he, his band was very popular with the Banditos, so mm -hmm. that's why oh, okay. I was curious. So yeah. Anyway, we weren't, keep going. We weren't too cozy with the Banditos. That's probably why you probably more, A little bit more with the Gypsy Jokers because I actually lived right behind their clubhouse in Ashworth Street in Wallingford, so I actually lived right behind them. Okay. Mm, okay. So there's that association too. Um, one of the brothers in the club came up to me and said, I have something for you, a camera. He holds his camera, it's like, what the fuck am I gonna do with a camera? I mean, please, you know? And he said, I don't know, I'm just told to give it to you, spiritually from above or whatever. And this troll was kind of like that, he was that kind of person. Mm -hmm. Fine, so the camera went home, sat on the shelf for a while, sat on the shelf for a while. One day I started reading about it and I took it outside, put film in, and took a couple pictures Took, took the film to the lab, and the guy at the lab was, oh, you kind of have something here. You should think about this. I'm like, yeah, fuck you. Psh, off, back on the, on the putt, Wait, off we I have went. to stop for a second. <laughs> oh, Dad, I no, can't no, say no, that. No, 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 no. I just have to explain to anyone under the age of 30 that when you take pictures on a camera, there's a stuff called film. Yeah, there's stuff that used to be called oh. film. It used to be called film. Yeah, and then you right. take it to a place, and they would develop it for you, and then it would be on pieces of paper. Yeah. Yeah, I called, just called, wanted to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it wasn't yeah. about the Carson. It was to explain oh, to the millennials good. what film is. Because yes. I, forgot, like, I forgot yeah. that that's, yeah. of course. And there's course. only, what, 26 or 30? It's 20, depending on the role. You yeah. Well, yeah, depending on the amount, format of the yeah. You the can't just pick camera, thousands of yeah. pictures. Yeah. You have to, mm -hmm. you only have a certain amount. Yes. And you have to, like, click the thing and move the shutter. Yeah, it's called the thing. Yeah. The thing, it's the f The lens, right. And there's a different sense of how you associate Back then with film too, there's a different timing where nowadays we're machine gunning images or anything's an image or this or that. Where back then it was more thought out because the, the way the camera operated is a more thought out situation. Right. Adjusting the lens yourself, getting the focus, winding the camera, putting the film in. There's this whole action of doing things along with it more than just boom, boom, here we go. And that's right. that sensibility is more and slows you down. And you didn't have Photoshop? You, no. you know, and you didn't, yeah. you couldn't like, A, selfies, you couldn't, you couldn't do selfies. You couldn't post in two seconds so you, you can get accolades. You couldn't like reshoot it, like, oh, I don't like how that looks, we'll do it again. You, it, it was like, you just were surprised with whatever You could back. do it again, but that cost you a lot of money. Exactly. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. Anyway, unless you had a 
like a Polaroid camera. And then you can look at it. Sure. Right nice. away, but. Okay. We're also living in a very instant world where people, through cameras, have gotten to a point where it's, they want this instant gratification. And as soon as these people take pictures, they want to get them up right away and get feedback and, and all this and that. Sometimes I'll hang on to stuff for months because I just don't like the energy of that. The story I just now released on Facebook of what I'm talking about when I lost my fingers and went through the whole thing of the camera coming into my life, moving into rock and roll, I didn't even post that thing, that, that, that story till f like four months ago I wrote it. Oh, wow. So I just posted wow. it. Wow, wow. So. And were you self-taught? I mean, did you learn everything on your own? As you pretty just, much, pretty wow. much. That's so the camera came to me and um, again, through, through, through the bikers, so I started photographing the, our, our runs and mm -hmm. I'm like, okay, I kind of became the person who, who photographed the club. And, and it kind of became this thing with the club where, where's Paul and the camera? We all want to be photographed and we all were doing this stuff and some of the guys had property so we'd go on a run to the property and hang out and take pictures of the shotguns. I should have brought some of these pictures. And the kegs all That's lined up. Oh. We can more. add them later. <laughs> um, the kegs all lined up and, and just, just our, our place where we had, um, a place just to go and hide and we could just be. Turn our music up and just drink beer and talk Harleys and mm -hmm. do our thing and shoot, target shoot or whatever. Um, of course, this was back in the early 80s and it, actually one of our um, runs is when Mount Hay St. Helens went off. Oh, oh really? Yeah, I remember Yeah, because we heard this big boom and we were all like, Okay, <laughs> where's that coming from? Because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> we're all sitting around with our Hold shotguns on, going, yeah. <laughs> none of us are shooting, and that's a pretty big boom. And, and so we were all really fairly concerned. A bunch of bikers running around going, okay, what's going on? What's going on? <laughs> pretty funny looking. Um, thinking that we're getting bombed or something. <clears throat> and then, of course, finding out my, my older brother, who's also with us at that point, so let's turn on the news, because maybe St. Helens is yeah. sure it was. Yeah. So anyway, so I started shooting that stuff and, and, and developing confidence and desire in, in, in doing it and, and moving forward with it, moving forward with it. It was, um, I, believe, I believe in the world that things come to you for a reason, things are meant to be, and when they do, when they do come to me, I'm very aware of that. And I look at that and I'm like, well, this came into my field. It's come into my field very loud and very strong. And I wait on something with some energy and see how loud and how powerful the energy builds up. Mm -hmm. Let it build up and then I'm like, okay, this is it. You know, I let it build up for a while. If it's still there and it's still physical with me, not just a mental thing, but also has to be in the physical where you really feel it. And photography started being that way for me, mm. like the guitar was. The guitar was such a physical e instrument for me, yeah. especially the way I played it. Um, see, it's interesting because I feel the same way as you. Things come into your life for a reason. Ergo Julie, and um, who is a force of nature. Yes. Uh, but I'm kind of like a retard. I'm, I'm not as uh, deep as you are. So I don't know. I'm, I'm up there. Yeah, I don't know what this means. And then it just hits me. And Julie has to hit me in the face a couple of times for me to get it. You, you're a little more focused, I think. Or, or you. I feel like you guys are kung fu fighting with your hands here. Because you, you talk with your hands like this. And you talk like that. But it's Thai, anyway. it's Isn't Italian it fun? Irish blood. Is I, yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I have I have an excuse. Okay. <clears throat> this is good. <clears throat> Keep going. No, but anyway. Yeah. So um, music, of course. Well, bikers and music go together. Was still. Mm -hmm. And here's the thing. <laughs> um, all my boys were Queen fans. Of course, they had no idea Freddie Mercury was gay, but here's all these bikers listening to Queen, thinking mm -hmm. they're all badass, and I'm like, you guys only knew. <laughs> it was my little inside joke about them. I never ever blew their bubble or told them that Freddie's really gay, but no one really knew back then how. Did they how, like Judas Priest too? Um, they were more Zeppelin, oh, okay. and, mm. and they, like. you know, they're more into the classic sort of rock, Rush, Zeppelin, Pink Floyd, um, Queen, you know, that yeah, kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, there's a couple other bands I'm thinking of back then. That or ACDC was another one oh, of yours. Yeah. You know, anything you bang your head against and get drunk with, and um, go off on. So, um, so I derailed the, the story. <laughs> you didn't derail nothing. I'm regrouping as I. When do. was your first rock and roll gig? So uh, the first thing, yeah. the first rock and roll gig was. Um, I'm trying to remember. I don't even remember when that was. <laughs> It's been so long. Um, Just make something up. <laughs> <laughs> I 
Put oh, it yeah, out there. Yeah, Queen, and I was <laughs> riding Harley's, and there was Queen. Oh, God, I jumped off the Harley and took a picture of him. No. Um, I gave Rob Halford his first Harley, man. <laughs> uh, so I, there, there were concerts at the Seattle Center. Um, to Are you talking about near the, um, there oh, um, outside? Yeah, 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 the outdoor yeah. shows, because my, my dad used, used to do those shows. They, uh, at the amphitheater. Amphitheater, yeah. thank you, thank yeah. you. And there was, that's when they used to have water in there too as well, yeah, which is the, really interesting. Which is really crazy that they, they have took the water, water there out. and people are playing and who, yeah. it was right. craziness. And yeah. they're like, someone's gonna get killed and crazily no one got killed. Yeah, no so, one ever died yeah. as far as I know. So when grunge started, they, they didn't put water in it anymore. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because, because our boys were all over the place. <laughs> Especially if Eddie, I mean, we know his antics on stage and jumping off stage and climbing on things and so on and so forth. So I think they, yeah. for Andy, uh, for Eddie's safety, they pulled the water. So, um, <laughs> but maybe not. <laughs> you get in trouble for that one. So we're talking like what, like eighty? So this is like eighty. Or? Oh no, later. Oh, 85, 84 85? or were something. The camera came earlier. to me eighty four, eighty five. Okay. I think is when okay. I first got it. But it was kind of put away. I didn't pay any attention to it. Like I said, I did a couple little things with it here and there around the house. Or, and there's a field in my backyard, so I went out there a few times and would take pictures. There was old buckets and stuff. There was an old barn. I would just do things just to, trying to find out what, what worked, what colors worked. And I was starting to get into that, starting to get deeper and deeper into it with the, the, color, the chroma colors, right. the, the chroma of a oh, color, yeah. how it affects mm -hmm. um, shape and image and all that through photography. I also paint, but as an oil painter, you can... Um, manipulate things a little bit through through color and depth of color and stacking and so on and so forth in the chroma but but with photography you have to fill it a little bit more and implement it in, in, in on, on a piece of film or a digital image nowadays so mm -hmm. and that's why I go back to the energy thing is the energy that comes through me goes through that little camera hole right. and out through a lens and there comes stuff yeah. You know, stuff happens. And that to me is extremely amazing. So that that for me really seduced me. Really seduced. Like, how does this work? Where does this come from? And I'm this kind of person. Like, I look underneath the table and do the screws. Look at the screws. See what the screw does. Put it back in. Like, okay, that's what that does. I'm that kind of person. I'm very curious and very aware of. So of every the world little knob and, and button on that camera, you're like, okay, I get it. Yeah, I want to know okay, what it you're does. You're into it. Okay. Yep. Totally want to know what it does and how, what, what I can and cannot do, how far I can push it, so on and so forth. I did the same thing on the guitar. Mm -hmm. It's like, what does this do with this noise and this yeah. sound and this pedal and this and that and the other thing? Well, did you? What? Um, oh, oh, sorry. No. no what just, was the first camera that you got? Do you remember? Nikon. That? Oh, it was an icon. Yeah, I haven't stepped away since. Oh. I stayed with Nikon the whole time. Okay. Just because of, of, of that was my first marriage. Mm. And I, I, I'm, I'm, tr I'm true to my girls all the way through. I hear you. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> so uh, I've stayed with Nikon the whole time. I just love what they are. Even though when I worked at Amazon, um, I was actually a lead fashion photographer at Amazon for a while in their um, e-com department before they moved. And there we used all cannons and stuff. Oh, okay. so, but for me, it's always been Nikon. I just love the feel. I like the color space of Nikons. Mm -hmm. Everything about them. You know, them. my aunt used uh, Nikon, and I was a Canon girl. So, yeah. and it is true. People do get married to their very much so. their camera and their so. system and so on and so forth because yeah. they get to know it. They get I'm to married to Windsor Newton. Yeah, when I do my paintings, I, I can't paint without anything but Windsor Newton. Really? I tried a whole bunch of them. They're all they're all crap. Go with Windsor Newton. Yeah. So. I use a lot of Windsor too, brother. Oh, okay. I'm yeah. with you on that one. Yeah. I'm a gambling too. Girl. Some gambling no. stuff I like out of Oregon. That's not bad. It's not bad. A little stickier. Put a little wax in it. You're good to go. Um, but so I started taking the camera down to the Seattle Center and started watching these bands. I'm like, you know, ah, okay, here we go. Now, Here's would you the like show up and just take pictures? Just, yeah, just shoot the bands. I just, and I didn't want to be recognize or anything. I just wanted to feel the stuff and see where I could go with it on my own terms in my own place. Mm. A lot of, when I, when I teach at colleges, when I teach, teach photography, and I've done this thousands of workshops, 
I go to colleges and give talks and stuff. And the main thing I tell people is find your friggin' voice first. Don't get caught up in the mechanics of this or that. Who's doing what or anything? Find who, out who you are. And that's what I wanted to do, is find Paul's voice mm. first. Because Paul's voice is what's going to stand out. If I don't have a voice, I don't have shit. There's nothing out there. There's no, there's no truth. There's not me. Yes, there's nothing. I agree. It's just, oh, I got a little this and I got a little that, and here's a picture. And there's no depth to it. And people are going to go, okay, great, next. I wanted people to go, whoa, shit, wait a minute. So in order to create that, I had to go out and find it within self, develop it, make that energy, make that force field, call it in, create it, find it, build it up, have that within self and go out and use that as my instrument to work well, with. Did, did you pick up on that or did other people pick up? Sometimes you, you have a voice, but it's other people who recognize the uniqueness of it. For example, if you were taking photographs of a band, or bands or whatever, and then someone saw them and went, whoa, these are really good, or these are really interesting, or you've got a really interesting angle. Was that what happened to you, or was it something that just... It was a guy, it was a guy when I took the first 12 shot, 12 shot roll of film in on my bike and dropped it off the lab and said, okay, just do whatever with this and just give it back to me. That's, and him saying something to me, sort of like, you know, I said F you and walked out the door kind of to him. Not directly, but kind of to myself, like whatever. <laughs> and I walked up the door with it, and I kind of looked at it again as I got home, and I'm like, you know, maybe he's onto something, he's telling me something, so. Um, it's kind of, a, I would say it's kind of a combination of a couple things, especially as a young artist, especially shooting rock and roll, because you don't, you don't really know what you're doing, it's just there's a force that was there, and it just said do this, so I, that's what I was, I went and did it, mm. you know what I mean? It was just this force, it was like, it's almost like I didn't have a choice. It, it, it became really loud in my ear. The camera kept going like, let's go do something, let's go do something. Was there a particular kind of, of band or music that really caught your attention as a photographer? I mean, was there stuff that you were more drawn to versus other stuff or? Oh, of course, of course. And I love all genres of music, um, but I'm always gonna be a rock and roll baby because that's what I grew up on, mm -hmm. you know, for sure. Um, I can't even remember the first bands I was shooting. I don't remember who they were, what they were, and... Well, that, <laughs> watch anything. somebody um, out there Shots, that band. Just there like, was a band Grr. called Shots, who <laughs> Martin was in. Um, that was one of the first bands I, I, familiar. I worked with. Was it like Shots with a Z or no, something? No, sh no sh just Shots with... Oh, okay. But they were a Seattle band, but they're more of a cover band, but they're real popular, and, they're, they're, okay. and, and Martin Ross was... was a, last name, forgive me, Martin, if I'm saying that. We're old friends, we go way back, I can't remember the man's last name. But anyway, so he was kind of the first start of that a little bit. So one of the band's singers recognized me taking shots and asked me if, if, if he could see them. Mm -hmm. Back then there wasn't a lot of guys on shooting, shooting bands, especially at the Mirror Amphitheater, so on and so forth. And so I, yeah, sure, sure. So I met with him the following week and he was like, can you shoot my band promos? because he liked what I did live. Cool. I, I shot, I, I did it all in black and white, and I kind of approached things a little differently. I wanted the band playing music and the star behind the band, or the star that they want to be. I wanted the grit of rock and roll. I mm -hmm. wanted the sweat. That I wanted the hard your, work. Yeah, your I wanted really the elements of these guys getting up, practicing moment after moment, day after day, getting that, getting that, getting that, pushing, 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 driving, driving, driving. To be a musician, you have to have this within you, and you have to have a lot of it. And then you have to have a lot of, I gotta find it, I gotta explore. And then even though you're dead tired, it's four in the morning, you just found this new sound. Oh, I, I need to go to bed. No, 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 <laughs> we don't go to bed at all. We gotta find out what this is and where it's gonna go. Next thing you know, it's six o'clock. So that drive is what I'm talking about. And that's what I wanted on film. Mm. I wanted their souls. I wanted their, their where they came from. I want your soul. <laughs> yeah, it's that soul. That's, that's, you know, that's their soul speaking Yeah, you're to pouring them. your guts out. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and music, you're doing, you're giving yourself to the world out there. That's what I'm saying, these guys have to give of themselves because they're giving their, their, they have something to say, it's in them, they gotta get it out, somehow, some way, and that's, that's what they do. Did you, do you prefer doing live versus uh, studio shots in, in terms of working with your Well, I think uh, I, I, just, well, I started off doing live, and then mm -hmm. again, I shot the band promos, and I can't remember what the band was called. Um, Forgive me. Uh, too many drugs, too many years of them. But um, to be honest, there it is. So 
you actually hung out with a lot of your subjects. I mean, you, oh, yeah, you weren't yeah, like a yeah, you, clock you, in, clock out. No, you, no, you were no. with these people. I spent time with yeah. them completely, and that's, that's how I wanted that depth. That was that Annie Lebowitz style of thing doing with the stones. That after, after seeing what she was doing, especially the shot of the stones in the elevator that, uh, that she took after a show, I think it was at the Fillmore in San Francisco, and they're all in the elevator, all rocked out, makeup bleeding down their faces, yeah. and they're all like this. And I was like, that's the shot. That's the shit. That's the energy. That's the place. They gave everything that they did on stage, and they're on the elevator going up for the next round of party or whatever else they got to do, and their next presentation, which is after you get off stage, you got another presentation, yes. even though you're completely exhausted. Well, that's actually, when you bring that up, that's a really good description or... or, or uh, I think of your work as the moments in between. It's like the, the, you've got the key moments and then there's that, those little in-between moments. Mm -hmm. And you capture those yeah, really you, you, well perfect. with your work. Yeah, where you catch wonderful. those quick moments um, where, that you almost miss. You know, like, like you almost miss, you, you blink and you miss that type thing. Um, and you, it seems like you look for those moments. Versus, versus the obvious shot, you know, like everybody goes for the key shots of, you know, the rock star shots, yeah, right? Yeah, he's then on the, stage, he's got his arms out, and the lighting's perfect, and yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Nothing wrong with that, it's but like you, you, got the, you got the real human soul kind of thing going. Thank you. Yeah. And I think, I think, I hate to say this, but in, in, due, in due honesty, um, I think my work back then was even more of that than it is now because of the change of digital. Oh, really? what that's done mm -hmm. and I still have that it's just sort of in a different way now I think mm -hmm. compared to what was what was back then back then it was a slower pace of it because you had to put film in the camera load the camera so on and so forth so these elements of moments that you waited in between where you recharge yourself and built that back up and kind of refocus or reshifted that energy to go back to that finding those little key moments and also you're dealing with film so it's a lot slower process with, with, with digital, it's a lot faster. It's just like, okay, brrr, there's a moment in there someplace. I know there is. Mm -hmm. But I still right. approach it with the same energy in the mm -hmm. same way. I just shoot a lot more of it a lot faster and have a bunch of them. And then I'm like, oh, God, which one do I pick? <laughs> Where back then, it was pretty much an isolated one. Yeah. <clears throat> also, certain bands had certain quality about them and certain things about them, too, as well. Certain bands just photographed really well. Alice in Chains was, for me, that band. Mm. They were just... It just so photographs you, you so well. You would say that was your favorite band to, to photograph? Probably. Oh, really? Probably, yeah. Also, my connection with them, my place with them, mm -hmm. um, had a lot to do with that, you know? Yeah. Um, the closeness that was developed with them to create the images that I could, I could create with them, you know? And I wanted that place with Alice in Chains because I knew that these guys were special. They're all really beautiful boys, really beautiful young men. I'm like, these guys, man, <laughs> There's, there's not gonna be a bad shot with them, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? There were pranksters a lot, which drove me crazy, because um, <laughs> I get ready to shoot, and then they do something, you know? And I'm like, okay, especially in the studio, that happened quite often. I'd have endless pictures of them doing funny faces or doing shit, just to fuck with me, just because they knew that I was ready to hit the camera and wind it, or back, of course, then I had power winders. Yeah, they, yeah. they had it down, they had that timer down. Wow. And they just, you know, it's, but it was great because it broke things up sometimes too, mm -hmm. you know, as well. Other times it was more, much more serious shoots. So they were just came in there more in a serious moment, and we did that, and, you know, so it just sort of depended on, depended on the band's mood too as well. I didn't over direct the bands or, or, or pour so much of my, myself into them outside of just uh, energetically, but not trying to like stamp who I was on them as well, as much as letting them just be who they were and having their stamp be on the image, because after all, I'm shooting the band. Yeah. I'm not shooting me, I'm shooting the band. And that's, you know, I'm there for them. But grateful for whatever came into me energetically or through the universe or whatever, that I was able to capture moments that I was able to capture them. But a lot of that started with Alice in Chains, mm. completely. Great. Now did you, you photographed them before you actually met them, correct? Like you actually went to a show first or yeah, did I you went, meet them first? No, I went to a show first. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So Randy Hauser, who was their first manager, called me. And this, at this point, I'd been shooting bands and starting to get a name around Seattle since, and it's starting to build up. And this and, is what, 87? 
Yeah, so okay. 87, I think okay. it was. And I was doing a lot with a I band three. called <laughs> Dan Reed and Network, who was <laughs> the Dan Reed and Network, who was a real popular band in Seattle at one time, and they were a really, really great band, and they were the yeah. band in Seattle to go see. Um, I was really close to them, I still am, I call them all the time. Brian James, who's a guitar player, is actually from Seattle, who was in that band, amazing guitar player, so good. The whole band was amazing, it was really a good band. But they're more of a party band, you know what I mean? So they, they had a lot to do with, with, with me finding a direction as well. I'd say probably it started there, because they were my first major band I started working with, and then, then it led right into Chains from that, from okay. that moment. No, you was said Randy, Randy called you? Or did, he, did he just kind of like look you up and call you or something? Or I'm not sure exactly how that all came together. Um, out someplace he heard about me, he approached me. I think we were in a club. I think it was actually, actually seeing Dan Reed Network, actually. Okay. Pier 70 or, or up at the old, what is that place called? It was way up in Aurora, 200th in Aurora or something. 200th in Aurora, what's up there? <laughs> I can't remember the name of it now, but it was... Was it, oh, uh, 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 it used to be, it used to be at Parker's? Parker's, yes. Yes. It was a huge, thank you. <laughs> I knew, I knew so I died, Huge around. club, <laughs> yeah, huge club up yeah. there. Yeah, and so the network played there all the time. So I think, because that's where I saw Randy, and he kind of approached me a little bit then. Um, there's also, I, I was Metal Church, um, a bunch of other bands I was shooting yeah. around that time too that were approaching me, Heart, um, a little bit, but that never went anywhere. Mm -hmm. um, there was a, I, I've had Well, probably, you said that du it was Duff McKagan who was the one who talked to you about coming up to Seattle in the first place, because you were down in L.A. I was down in L.A., yeah, too, for a little um, bit, with Guns N' Roses and yeah. stuff. Like, yeah. And Duff, at that point too, was saying, you know, I, sh sh Duff, I was shooting Duff at his house and he was to go back up to Seattle, maybe, or something. We were talking about it, about home, about Seattle and stuff, and I was kind of going back and forth. But at that time, I was, I was in, in Los Angeles a lot more. Um, my girlfriend at that time was an up-and-coming fashion designer, hence the fashion. Oh, okay. So she, she monopolized a lot of my time, because she was, I mean, she was in Barney's, I mean, her stuff took off, and we had to pump pictures out constantly. And she did a Betsy Johnson thing where she was actually the model for, for all her cards, all her images, and so on and so forth. She wanted to follow that uh, Vivian Westwood, Betsy Johnson mm -hmm. sort of sensibility. And of course, she was dropped dead gorgeous, so of course, you know, and she's my girlfriend, so. And actually, a lot of the Alice in Chains shots were down by the Cedar River where we lived. We had a little house on the Cedar River. And so a lot of changed images were around that area. Cause so was that your decision to do that? I mean, mm -hmm. did you actually, because yes. like, you know, you had the railroad tracks on uh, in Soto and, and the river shots and some, you know, the, the mansion. And all things. the so locations. Were those your decisions? Yeah, all the okay. locations. That's, that's where I'm a little tired on things is my locations. When, when I shoot, especially not, not so much live, live, it's just going to be what it's going to be. I get in there and see what the cans are going to do, try to measure the lights so on and so forth. Especially when back in those days when you're shooting film, is a whole different world, <laughs> shooting live. And also you didn't have the light on stage back then like you do now. I mean, the stages are so lit up. If you can't get a shot, you're a complete idiot. You know, back then it was just film and there's one or two cans in some right. small club and guys moving, especially Mike all over the place with the bass. And, and is following Mike and running with him and with film and stuff. And it was challenging at times. And then he was in and out of light. So I'm like, when's he in the light? Well, there it is, click. Did I get it? But he's back out of light so fast. So back then it was a, it was a road race too as well. Um, but when I shot the bands, um, promo shots, album stuff or whatever, usually uh, was very thought out. I'd really like look at the band, their energy, who they were, their sound, their music, what the words were in their music, had a lot to do with, with things. Um, down in a hole. <laughs> yeah. In, 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 the, in the pool. Right. I shot them down in this pool and that came from down in a hole. Well, I mean. Losing control. It's just like, ah, oh, there's the shot. So the song would go through my head and I would be, ah, uh huh, boom, there, that's what we're shooting. Excellent. So sometimes the music would really influence the locations for mm -hmm. me. Also the band, who they were, their presentation, how they looked, their energy, all of that was very, very, very much a part of, 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 the, of the overall image. 
So I, 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 I pull in, I call in a lot of things to get an image done. It's mm -hmm. just not, oh, here's a place, let's go do it there. You know, I go look at the location, I, I color time it. So in other words, I'd look at it at different times a day. When do I want to shoot it? When's my optimum time to shoot black and white here to get the most contrast and getting four guys to all be together at the same moment, which is always interesting, especially those boys. Um, getting them all to be together. A lot of times they would just turn it on and it would just be like, shit. Mm -hmm. And they were so good in front of the camera most of the time that it would just, the images would just flow, would just come. Where other bands go, ooh, wasn't quite as easy. But for Chains, for some reason, there was such a flow with them and I, the mm -hmm. images just would pop off the camera. Just oh, wow. like, Jesus. You know, it would surprise me a lot of the times. It's because of who they were, mm. you know? So, Good for them. Good for you. so it's just not all me, it's all the other elements. But me being aware enough, I think, to, to understand those sensibilities and try to capture that in film and get those moments mm -hmm. and make things timeless and ages so those, those images are as powerful back then as they are today and vice versa. Mm -hmm. And that was really important to me is not to age my images or yeah. give them a stamp of a timer. You know, again, why I shot them in black and white a lot. Yeah. Also, I knew that chains would have this sort of, this, this way about them, and I wanted to, to start them out kind of in black and white, even though a lot of the studio stuff was in color, but that was requested by labels and sure. management and so on and so forth. They wanted more of the color stuff for magazines so, and whatnot. And those are the ones they were more funny at and, and acted up in and so mm -hmm. but when we were shooting black and white and not on location they were a lot more serious and, and really like there and depending on the locations on the train tracks i got both sides of them i got gotcha. a really funny side to them but i would do really funny things in front of them to get mm -hmm. them all laugh naturally and i knew i could get that from them and mm -hmm. i wanted a few 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 shots of them in in their young time pushing this really hard music but at the same time there's this sweetness about them that's coated over this music that makes the music not only deeper but beautiful and touches different parts of your, your heart and soul. Mm -hmm. And they have that element in their music. Um, yeah. Very much so. Interesting. Spe especially in Jar of Flies, it really shows that. You know, that they, they grew into it. But I knew that was coming. So I wanted to photograph them back then that way for their future. Gotcha. Interesting. Interesting way of seeing things. So. I have some Seattle <laughs> history questions for you, speaking of music and things. Around this time, this is when before or after Mother Love Bone? Around, you, around and Mother Love Bone. I was going to ask you about Andy Woods, if you ever had any lot, with lot, Andy. Uh, lots and with Mother Love Bone. Andy. Okay, yep. yeah. 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 Loved Andy. Loved his craziness. Yeah, who didn't? You know? <laughs> Loved his, his, his poeticness. Yeah. I remember just, just like him and I in the makeup room, we, there was a shoot going on and a baby peed on his head or something, something with a baby or some darn thing. <laughs> but, and, and Andy and I were in the, in the makeup room talking about it. And he's like, never again, he's wiping the makeup off. Or the, the baby stuff, a baby pee off his face or something, whatever, the baby peed and he's wiped. And he's all distraught and I'm like, fixing his hair. And he goes, oh, thank you, brother. And get himself all right. And there's something about and, Andy that was so theatrical He's mm -hmm. always theatrical. Yeah. And on stage, I remember like at the Vogue, he'd always throw candy to the audience. I always thought that was so magical about him. He'd do these little things that was just that extra step to the audience. His Mad Hatter hats, his costumes. You know, he was like Freddy that way. He was, he was or like, like Very Jagger. Very showmanship. Very showmanship. Yeah, yeah. He was that, that kind of front man. Mm -hmm. I would have loved as we all would have to seen where that would have gone. Oh yeah. God bless, it went as far as it was supposed to go in this lifetime, I guess. I don't know, I don't have answers for that. Yeah, me neither. But that is a sting in my heart every day because I remember that, that, that energy of his. Mm -hmm. It's really bright and beautiful and his songwriting capabilities, forget it. Yeah, forget about Chloe's it. Chloe's yeah. song, I mean, come on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, just that came from that, that candy throwing guy, but there's that other place to him there's that back door that if you walk in there, there was so much depth and awareness and clarity and beauty in that man mm -hmm. that he just, again, pushed through, wanted to push through the music. Yeah. So he was, he was another person I loved photographing, especially live, just because of his nuances on stage and what he'd give to the audience, he also would give to the camera. 
So if he's giving that to the audience, I'm definitely going to get that. Yeah, I'm going to get that on film. Yeah, most definitely. Exactly. And it, it made amazing images. So the images had a lot to do with great timing in the universe. And though I've said a lot of times in my life, F life, I've had really horrible timing in my life, a bunch of struggles in my life. But the other side of that, as I also look at things, I've had amazing, beautiful, beautiful moments with bands and with people and that never would have happened without being in that position, without being a rock photographer, without yeah. Well, you, Being in those you moments. a lot of photographers are considered observers, but there's there are actual and, and I think you kind of run in the gamut of being not only an observer but also a participant. Um, in terms of you weren't just standing around taking pictures while everybody's doing their things. A lot of times you would interact with your your subjects as well to kind of punch up what was going on or bring yeah you're or, right or, there in the mail store and and, and mm -hmm. you didn't just like i said before you don't just clock out like you didn't just go okay guys see ya i'll, I'll you'll see me in a couple weeks when i've got the contact sheet and you can pick out whatever mm -hmm. um you were really heavily involved in the scene itself i mean you you weren't just you know documenting it in in many ways and it, were you hyper aware of that at the time that you were you know, this, to, was, to, this became your world too, you know. To, to, to a point, I, I think, I think when you're in a time that you don't know is a time, and that's what the grunge was, we knew yeah. it was something, yeah. we didn't know what, especially at the beginning, but we all knew it was something. So we all participated in the energy and the images, especially early Alice in Chains images, which I love that really reflected those moments, those places that, that were of, of that. You know, there was just this, there was this moment happening and it, it's reflected in the images, but we weren't sure what it was yet. Mm. We just knew it was coming. You knew it was something. It was coming, something. yeah. yeah. But it, it, was, it was there visually already. It was already there visually. And I saw it visually and I'm like, okay, this is, this is going places. Because it, it, you just felt it. You just felt it. And also their music, what they were doing with the music. Oh, and then the other thing you have to think about too, and I said this on when they did the interview at the, um, when, at the show last year at, at the studio, the mainframe, um, on King 5 when they did the interview of the show, I, I said this to them, it's really interesting to me, and, and I, I, I hold this all the time in my heart, how all these musicians landed in the same city at the same time, all, in, all these beautiful, amazing men and girls, as well, the gets so on and so forth. Babe right. in Toyland, I shot them all. I got, mm -hmm. you know, so seven I did year a lot. Bitch. Seven year bitch. Yep. Yeah. L7. Faster per, per pussy cat or whatever it was. Mm -hmm. No, no, that was LA. That was LA. Mm -hmm. That was LA. That was Tammy. Tammy. Tammy's band. Tammy Down's band. Okay, wait a minute. But there was an. What's that? Well, pl pussy galore. I think pussy, it was. Pussy galore. Yeah. Yeah. It was some, mm -hmm. Pussy something. I, I remember that. Something. But. Um, what about heart? Well, Hart wasn't part of the grunge. Yeah, it wasn't. Thing. That yeah. was more yeah, seven. Yeah, that was more seven. Yeah. yeah, Hart was Hart. They were their own. Thing. Yeah, they were their own thing. Hart was already Hart a was, super group. You know, yeah, they yeah, were. Hart was like a main to me, yeah. or like you too. They they were just this, this is like, own this thing. This is like when Hart was White Hart. You know, before Hart became Hart. You know what I yeah, mean? Yeah, I hear so, you. Yeah. Yeah. But so. Um, did we just derail you? <laughs> I'm sorry. No, no, I, it's okay. We can go this Julie way, that and way. I derail I'm each other. In and I'll hold on <laughs> yeah. with all I have, and I'm good to go. Okay. So, so, are there are there moments that you wish you had your camera? I mean, were there things that happened over the years, especially in Seattle, where you were like, oh, I wish I had photographed that, you know? Oh you yeah, know? yeah, yeah. There's a thousand things I wish I would have photographed. I wish I would have spent more time. I wish I would have been in the grunge scene a lot more um, and stayed with it a lot more than what I did. But again, I had a bunch of fashion stuff coming at me and, and it was paying the bills and that money was getting louder and louder and bigger and bigger. Yeah. And my girlfriend too at the time, her line was getting huge and I'm like, the responsibilities were getting really big for that. And we were most of the time in New York. We were in New York all the time between LA and New York. So I wasn't even in Seattle that much anymore at that time either. You know, yeah. and it's sort of taking over you, the show a you little had bit. A, I think you left, what, in 93? I mean, 93 was when you kind of exited out. Yeah. Um, although that's kind of when everybody exited out, I think. I stayed here. Well, I, I mean. Other callings doing other things, yeah. and I was, I, I, I still love the you music You stayed here, stuff, Julie. <laughs> yes. 
That's that's when we became magic artists. Yes, that's remember I, that. I entered. Remember, in. remember that little thing that we used to I do a long time ago. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, I, he's right. There, there was that. There was a period of time between '88 and '92 that was really, really exciting. The air, the air here was charged, and I don't know. Um, I was working in advertising, so my soul was sucked out of yeah, my body. Yeah. So you were an egghead. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. There was there wasn't a night in Seattle that you couldn't go and see great music. So every night I was out till six a.m. in the morning, night after night, day after day. I wanted to capture all of it, everything. So by 1993, I was toast, <laughs> too, as well. I was getting a little burned out, a little tired, being up every night. My drug issues were through the roof, and I had to, I had to step back more than anything, mm -hmm. mostly because of that. Also losing my girlfriend. She said, if you don't get off this shit, I'm gone. Oh. And we're trying to buy the house in the Cedar River, and she was right. She was just like, you need to change, mister, because mm -hmm. I, mm -mm. you know, and she was right. She was yeah. very much right. Were you able to get your shit together then, or did that happen later? Did what? Did, were you able to get your shit He's clean then? He's never got or, his or, shit clean. What? <laughs> what? Do you, do you have any funny stories shit to Shit together? I don't know what he's that never, means. He doesn't, he's, yeah. None of us have. Um, do you task have funny taken. To tell? Of course I'm on, do you have anything on to spot. Pull, pull out of the vault? Anything funny, stories funny to that tell. you remember from... Yeah, because Dan gave us the 10 minute sign about two minutes ago. Yeah. Oh, he did? Ah, yeah. okay. I don't know if it comes to me. I'm, I'm one of those people that things just has to come to me. It just has to be there. I, when I'm like, sometimes put on the spot, trying to think of a funny moment. I mean, I, I guess one of the things I, I remembered a lot was, was Chains doing their funny thing every time I go to hit the camera button and how that would go on and they'd make more and more faces. And, how I'd, one of these days, guys, this is going to get out there and they make even bigger faces. And I'm like, okay, fine. You know? So it's, I don't know, there's so many amazing moments. Well, are you ever going to do a book? People have asked me that, but I don't know if I have enough to do a book, to be honest with you. I don't know if there's enough there. If I did do a book, I want to go to the families. I want their words with the pictures. I want the families' words, because the families are what's important with the bands there. The families are everything. That's where the boys came from. So if I was going to do a book, I want the family's input in the book as much as my input. Mm -hmm. Everybody's doing a book on, or not everybody, but the people who have done a book have done it a certain way. And I want my book, if I did a book, would be the images, would be the values of the band, the family values, where they came from, who they were. A little bit of a history too, I, I, I yeah, think. Yeah, yeah, a little bit more mm -hmm. than just they were this and this and that. It's mm -hmm. like, no, no, there's a lot more here to that. Yeah. My images say that. So it'd be good to have like moments like mom, oh, I remember when so and so did this or you know, like the other day at the Lane Staley tribute and Nancy gets up and sings her song every year. And this year she said these little these little moment things and I'm like, that's it. She said, Blaine, get up and go feed the kitty. You know, right before the song starts, she would say these little mother words, and I was like, that's it. Mm. That's exactly what I'm talking about. Blaine, it's time to get up and get your cereal, get ready for school. She just, it was, it was so powerful that she said these two little things real quick. That way, it's like, okay, family, reality, people, not just rock stars. This is a mother up on stage who had a son who died of drugs, mm -hmm. who was a rock star, yeah. and this is still her son and how she still has those moments, yeah. how she still sees him. That's what I want in the book. Mm. That's, That's pretty I deep, want. yeah. I want those. Yes. Yeah. Well, especially, I don't, people focus a lot, especially with Seattle, they, they focus on the dark. Yeah, yeah, Like, everyone course. likes yeah. to focus on the dark stuff. And, and the, you know, yeah, there were drugs. It can get a little old. But, you know, people didn't do drugs because it was a horrible thing, you know? You didn't do it when you're 15. You don't drink because you're going to have a cirrhosis of the liver. I mean, that's not the, the drive. You want to go have fun. And, and I remember, you know, yeah, there was, things got can get dark, but mm -hmm. there was a lot of fun stuff going on, and everybody was having a really good time, and everybody was, uh, there was a certain level of joy 
that was happening. Oh, completely. And you know, and I, I remember. Otherwise, all up, those clubs wouldn't be full. Right. Yeah, they wouldn't. Yeah, they wouldn't be full. Energized. They'd be empty. Bands. Yeah. And, yeah. yeah. and there was yeah. a lot so of like, like no. people laughed all the time. Like you were laughing all the time. You were goofing off all the time. Everybody's running around being idiots all the time. And it's just, you know, and and. And unless I think, you worked in advertising. Yeah, unless you're, <laughs> unless you're Brian. Um, and I think that that's the problem is, is we get so hyper, you know, when, when, when you're running around and you're being silly, everybody, you know, and then you trip and fall down, everyone focuses on when you're down on the ground rather than the, the other stuff. And I think that's what it winds up so frustrating when people talk about Seattle and grunge and things like that is they yeah. immediately they focus go the into dark the stuff. dark yeah. stuff. Yeah. Where it's like, no, that's not why, even why it even came around in the first place. I mean, you, you didn't, I mean, none of, nobody did what they did because of the dark stuff. You were actually, it was despite the dark stuff. Everyone right. was doing stuff because you were fighting the dreariness and the crappy jobs and the, you know, you were being young mm. and full of vitality. And that's where, you know, that's what gets lost. And I think that um, when, if we don't, capture that sometimes I feel like we you know even even all the dark music the music was dark but nobody else was nobody was you know it's like yeah like if someone actually, the sound of it was dark but not all the like, lyrical was well, dark kind of like no and the people actually really weren't dark no no no, no. no. no, no. So and everybody everybody also, what thinks, is your idea of dark yeah. Yeah. See, let's, let's, let's talk it's about like, that, too. If you were so to read dark, my... What's dark, we're running, we're running. What's I dark know. to you? <laughs> no, well, like, my whole thing is, like, for example, if someone were to pull out my diary, mm -hmm. right? And that I, I, the only time I ever write in my diary is when I'm pissed off. So if, if I were, if, if that was my legacy left behind, people would be like, wow, she is a pissed off human being. And I think the music and things... Yeah, some of it was dark, but that doesn't mean these were dark people. That's like, that's where they channeled that energy. Yeah, I hear you. You know, not not they weren't dark people. No. You know, and that's where, you know, they're, they're, that's where I think people forget that that creative people, I, I, some of the funniest, <clears throat> nicest people I know do the darkest art. You know, like Alan uh -oh. Williams uh, yeah. is mm -hmm. one of the nicest, sweetest people on what. <laughs> He's one of the nicest, sweetest people on earth, but his stuff, his, if you look at his artwork, it is the deepest, darkest yeah. stuff imaginable. Like, you, you would just think this guy was just black, but he's not at all. You know, he's just a it's real... It's kind of like Bernie Wrightson, you know? He did all that horror stuff, but you meet him, he's one of the funnest guys you ever... nicest, sweetest dude you ever met. Yeah. yeah. And so that's, that's why I think things like with your idea with your book, where you wanted to do something that really reflected who these people were. And, and the times, the, the times between like 87 and 93 was actually, you know, most of it, 95% of it was fun times. Yeah, there were some really, really good times, yeah. really good music, really good people, really good everything. I just, yeah, I don't, I don't buy the whole dark shit. We live in a dark city. Yeah, no kidding, right? And so, so, okay, the sound is dark, you know, well, I don't know about that. You know, I don't know about, is Chloe dark? No. No. It's not at all. Julie's the opposite of dark. Uh. <laughs> I'm the opposite of dark. <laughs> yes, I'm sunshine. So. I, think, I think I got labeled that way, you know, because of the sound of it a little bit and stuff, mm -hmm. but I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't buy into the whole, whole dark thing. Yeah, I don't. And I think that yeah. needs to be released and, and let's like approach this a little differently, look at yeah. the music a little differently. You know, there's, this music has so much depth to it and so much power, and it, this, it took over the world. Our little dark city came in and said, oh, guess what, your ass is ours. This is real music, here you go, boom. Yeah. And the whole world went, oh shit. Wait a second, yeah. Yeah. hello. Yeah, mm -hmm. this, is the, this is our voice, this is who we are. I mean, that was a whole generation. You name one music scene that did that. Name one. The Beatles, maybe, the early 60s? Maybe, to that level? Yeah. Mm. The British movement, yeah. Maybe that whole, whole Laurel Canyon scene, maybe in the 60s. Not even that, possibly. yeah, but not that, not that, not, not yeah. to that level, yeah. but close, but not to that level. And I was going to say also that, that time, mm -hmm. you know, of course, Mama and the Papas and so on and so forth. That whole, that whole time, too, was, was pretty big. Yeah. You know, but not grunge, I, I don't know. Yeah. It, it, it hit the whole world. Paul, is there anything you want to leave us with? 
before we wrap it up. Is anyone, what are you, work, um, what are you working on right yeah, now? Yeah, yeah, what, tell us. I just did do fashion stories I'm in magazines. I just shot one two weeks ago, or, so I'm doing the final edits and sending it off to the magazine. Um, doing a lot of scanning the old Alice in Chains and, and the Mother Love Bone and, and all the other negatives I have, doing a lot of that. Yeah, I was lucky. Um, I actually got to see the contact sheets. Very few people now, have seen these contact um, sheets. Excuse me, did you just use the term contact sheets? Oh yeah, for millennials. A contact <laughs> sheet is when you take a sheet of, of photographic paper and you put strips of film on Negative. it. Negative. And then you flash light on it and it makes little tiny pictures on one piece of paper. Um, then you and take a magic marker and you, and you do it in the dark the room. Ones that, yeah, and you do it in the dark room. And that's a whole other part of photography that's lost. You have to go in. That's yeah. a whole other art form is being in the dark room. Yes. So that's the other thing is when I shot the bands, I also had to think of the dark room and how it was going to come across in there. So I had that other element. Also, I'm shooting. How's this going to look? How am I going to run the film? How am I going to process the film? How am I shooting, shooting the film to process it? Because I had to do all that too as well. So I had to be a technician. Yeah. With it. So you still do the old fashioned stuff. You still, still go into the dark oh, room. You do. And, so yeah. the whole show that we had last year was all hand done. I wanted to be true to the time. I didn't want to go digital with it. I wanted to hand print, even though it was, a, it was kind of an emotional journey because it was images I haven't seen for 30 years. In fact, one moment, I guess the, the woman in, who comes into the dark room that I rent, she was coming in to test the chemistry and I was standing there bawling a little bit. There's tears and she was mm. like, are you okay? And, there, and she looks down and here's this picture of Lane in the tray. And uh, I was like, no. Yeah, no, I'm not okay, yeah. No, I haven't seen this for years. And that moment, I remember that I had a moment with him and then I remembered it and it just, you know. So going, I knew going into the dark room, but I had to get this stuff out there. I'd been sitting put away for 30 years. I'm like, I'm selfish, fuck me. I gotta I got get this out there for the families, for everyone. It needs to be out there. Um, and we only did, we only, I think we only did 42 of the photos and there's quite a bit more. And I was like, he actually showed me, I got to see a whole bunch of the contact sheets of stuff that still hasn't been mm. uh, developed in, in terms yeah. of, of yes. photographs yet. Um, so he's got quite a bit of work. Although I do know you've lost some of it. Yeah, there was uh, a couple, uh, one horrible accident that oh, okay. we lost. A, a little bit of it, yeah. so. Um, so we did some lose some of the negatives. Stuff, unfortunately, but yeah. <clears throat> I try not to talk about it a lot, but anyway, there was a, a water there's situation. Still, there's still in, a lot left, the, and the, it, that was really unit. fun to see uh, was some of the stuff. So I, I do hope eventually you, you... Yeah, there'll be more and more coming stuff I'm trying to save maybe for the book too, if there is a book, you know? It's like, okay, we, when I did the show, I'm like, okay, there's certain things I'm gonna pull back and, and not put in, and, and again, I'm still, even though you, you think I have a volume of work, it's still limited, some of it is gone. Uh, there's some stuff on the internet, I'm like, that's my image, where did that come from? How'd they get that? I haven't seen that in years, I don't even have it anymore. You know, it's like, okay, wow, that's my image, what's going on? That happened today, twice. <clears throat> I'm like, okay. Another one, someone's got my image on a t-shirt, and I'm like, Whoa, uh-uh, well, how'd that happen, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know? Exactly. So I also have to be a police in my work, too. Yeah, hey, kid, bullshit. give me five bucks, you gotta take the shirt off. Mm -hmm. <laughs> a lot more than that, who printed that? Yeah, They're exactly. gonna get a visit from me. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> disrespectful. <clears throat> so, um, there's more work coming up, but I wanted to print all the images and be true to the time, put everything in black and white paper, that's great. In the frame. So it meant going in the dark room, having emotional moments, but it was important to get, do that. I knew I would have to, to walk that path, and it was worth it. It was, it was another sacrifice. I think also, as an artist, we constantly have to make sacrifices for others. And that's part of being an artist. If you're not willing to do that, then how much of an artist are you really? Mm -hmm. I agree with you 100%. You Paul, know? that is why we have to have you back. <laughs> Thank you. You're one. Thank you. Well, on that note, um, thank you so much for being on the show. I want to thank yeah. again the Palace Theater and Art Bar here in Georgetown. Seattle. Thank you. Yes, thank you guys. Thanks, Mark, mm -hmm. yeah, for thank bartending. You. Thank you, our esteemed, our tiny, yeah. our tiny little yes. crew over here. And thank you to Dan and John, thank our everyone. killer crew. Yeah. yeah, for running our cameras <laughs> and sound. And yeah. um, and and again, you know, we'll be here. We'll in be October, here next month, yeah. and uh, hope to have you soon. And and eventually, you know, oh, we will have his information uh, 
on our YouTube page, yeah. uh, his website, uh, where you can look at more of his work, um, Paul's wonderful work. So, so yeah. Yeah, sounds great. We're going to see you guys next time, okay? All righty. Bye bye. bye. Well, thanks, you guys, for coming down, and you didn't even heckle.